It is a privilege and a blessing and an honor to be able to bring in and usher the New Year's preaching the Word of God here at Southside Bible Church. I'm very thrilled and excited. Join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for bringing us into a new year. We're so thankful to see it. And Father, we know that as we go into this new year, we pray that you would increase our longing for you more and more day after day, that we would behold Jesus Christ. God, I just pray as we preach this text from Romans that you would open the eyes. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Twenty seventeen marks a significant milestone in church history. This is actually the five hundred year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. So you will see in different churches and as well as uh, uh, different lectures. I know that the, the the Master's Seminary as well. They'll be having a conference that's celebrating the five hundred year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, and it is a big deal. In fifteen seventeen. 500 years ago, a man who was described as the wild boar in the Roman vineyard, an ogre who destroyed the unity of the church, the renegade monk, would reach a tipping point with the level of hypocrisy and immorality in the church of his day. He would then author 95 thesis statements and attack the selling of indulgence from John Tetzel and Pope Leo X. Luther would nail these 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Castle Church, and in doing so, light the fuse that would explode into a multi-decade Protestant Reformation. It was a call to return to Scripture as the Word of God. It was a call to replace the papal authority with the authority of Jesus Christ. Ulrich Zwingli would later advocate the importance of expository preaching. It was a call to reform theological abuse for personal profit. It was a call to put the Bible in the hands of the common man and teach them the whole counsel of God. It was a call to hold church leaders accountable for lewdness and false piety. No more penance, no more purgatory, no more adulterating the word of God for personal gain, no more peddling the gospel of Jesus Christ for profit. It was a call to preach the only way for man to be saved by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Jesus Christ alone. In 500 years, after reading history, historical books about the Reformation, I look around and I ask myself, what have we learned? Why is it so difficult to find a church these, these days that preaches the truth of God's word. In 500 years, how on earth could we have produced 500 different brands of Christianity with each one looking more and more like the world system? And the question that remains, what will they write about us, church? Historians, what will they say about us? I see some young men in here are preparing to enter the the gospel ministry and shepherd the flock of Jesus Christ. When is your watch? What will they record about you? What will they say about us? In America, we're on the precipice. The political tides are shifting and postmodern relativism is now the status quo. Homosexual gender is on the rise. Euthanasia is gaining traction. Parents don't evangelize their children. Children are getting their theology from movies and their identity from social media. But what will they say about us? 500 years after the dawning of the Protestant Reformation, how will the church respond? What will we do now that it's our watch? It turns out that the great football coach, Vince Lombardi, had some wisdom when he said, sometimes you need to go back to the fundamentals. He would often start 
the first football practice of his perennial championship Green Bay Packer football team by saying, gentlemen, this is a football. Beloved, I ask you that you would consider these things. 500 years, you know, will they write about us? Especially here in America, evangelicalism. Things are changing, aren't they? Turn with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1. Now, for two or three years prior to 1517, Martin Luther would find himself lecturing to students through the book of Romans, but privately, he wrestled that he had a need to be justified before God. He states that he felt like he was just wasn't doing enough to be saved. He would confess his sins regularly and keep the monastic vows to perfection. He would even go so far as to self-inflict punishment over his own body. But while studying in the tower, he would get stopped in his tracks when he approached our text this morning, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. It reads, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, and he quotes Habakkuk, man shall live by faith. Join me in prayer one more time. Father, I just thank you so much for this opportunity. I just ask that Jesus Christ would be put on display and the gospel truth would be preached. Open our hearts, soften them. It's in Christ's name, for his sake that we proclaim. Amen. The epistle to the Romans has been referred to, when you look at the, the, Paul's letter to the Romans, it's been referred to as Paul's magnus opus. It's referred to as the pillar in all New Testament writing. One pastor makes a statement that if you ever were stranded on a desert island and you got to choose to keep with you one book of the Bible, choose Romans. Luther calls it the very purest gospel. It's been referred to as Paul's treaty of the righteousness of Almighty God revealed to mankind. Out of all of Paul's letters, Romans is by far the longest and most theologically significant. God used the book of Romans to convert Augustine. He used it to convert Martin Luther, John Wesley, and Tyndale calls it the light and a way to the whole rest of Scripture. It's almost as if Paul is boldly writing, this is the final word on the effective power of the gospel. By the time Paul writes this letter, he had already established multiple church plants all around the Mediterranean Sea. He is completing his third missionary journey. He has raised up men who would be able to continue the work of the ministry. And while collecting benevolence, offering from the different churches, he sets his eyes on the next phase of his ministry. Advancing the gospel to the west, he will now try to go to Rome and eventually Spain. Luke records in Acts 20, 1 through 3. And after the uproar in Ephesus, he ceased. Paul sent for the disciples, and when he had exhorted them and taken his leave of them, he departed to go to Macedonia. And when he had gone through these districts and had given them much exhortation, he came to Greece. And there he spent three months. Within Greece, Paul himself in the city Corinth for three months, through the hands of Tetarus, he writes the symphony masterpiece on gospel the theology that is open on your laps right now. And his objective, send the letter with Phoebe to introduce himself and his plans to preach the gospel in the West after delivering the benevolence to Jerusalem. Secondly, his objective is to provide the Christians in Rome with a full explanation of the gospel message centered around, centered around the imputed and imparted righteousness of Christ. Thirdly, secure a missionary base for future evangelism work in Spain. 
And fourthly, unify the believers in Rome that were made up of both Gentiles and Jewish Christians. And as we approach our text, Paul writes in Romans, we come here, we start in verse 13. When we look at verse 13, he says, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often plan to come to you and have been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both the wise and to the foolish. So in the, when Paul opens his letter, the, he writes his Roman epistle, he opens up with introducing himself. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called his apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. And then he's going to go, he's going to launch into a whole narrative on, I guess, a gospel mini, where he talks about Jesus Christ, which was promised, the gospel which was promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scripture concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he's going to go on and build some rapport in his letter up front by asking them, telling them that I'm thankful for you. And, I, and for God whom I serve, my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his son is my witness as to, as to how unceasingly I make mention of you. And when he gets down to verse 13, we get down to verse 13, it says, I don't want you to be unaware or ignorant, brethren, that I often have planned to come to you, Christians in Rome, and have been prevented so far so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. And in 14, he says, I am under obligation, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Now, Paul tells us at the end of Romans why he was prevented. He says, And thus I aspired to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, they who had no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. For this reason I have often been pre prevented from coming to you, but now with no place for me in these regions. And since I have had for many years a longing to come to you, whenever I go to Spain, I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. But now I am going to Jerusalem, serving the saints. Therefore, when I have finished this, I have put my seal on this fruit of theirs. I will go on by the way to you to Spain. So what has happened up until the, to this point is that when Paul is writing, he's more than likely writing in Corinth through... At, through Greece, in Greece, in Corinth, where he's now staying there for three months. He writes this epistle to the Romans, and as he's writing this letter to them, he's now making plans to deliver the benevolence money back to Jerusalem, on which that he would hope to, after that, go to Rome. That's his plans. We know that as we look at the book of Romans towards the end, that we see that that Paul actually asked for their prayer request and asking them to pray for me. I know that when I go to Jerusalem, that they may be looking for me. It may not turn out all, all right. And those of us who have followed the narrative of Acts know that, that when we walk into Acts chapter 20, we see that Paul actually begins to say that the Spirit has testified that bonds and chains await me. So we know that this is the mindset of Paul as he writes this letter. And so he's been prevented because Paul was busy establishing the gospel around, all around the Mediterranean. And now we find him here writing and saying, I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. It did not matter who Paul ran into. Rather, it was the culture of Greeks at Corinth or the natives when he was shipwrecked in Malta, whether it was the philosophers at the Areopagus or the suicidal jailer in Philippi. It didn't matter if it was 
witnessing to a runaway slave in Rome or if it was witnessing in the courtroom of King Agrippa, Paul was obligated to share the gospel wherever he went. He felt obligated. This was the call. And I have a question to some of the men here who see their future in, in ministry. My question is, do you have that same disposition as Paul? Who are you obligated to? In verse 15, Paul would say, so for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also in Rome. This eagerness comes from the word prophetless, which gives the connotation that he had a ready and willing spirit. It didn't matter what obstacles was going to be before Paul. He says, I am eager and willing. I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. It's almost as if Paul was like a track sprinter squatted in his blocks who readies himself for the sound of the gun. Do we have this same type of disposition, a readiness to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'll tell on myself briefly, this past week I, was, I went to get a haircut at the bar, a barbershop off of Colfax in Denver, and I stepped out the barbershop, and as soon as I got out, I was thinking in my, in my head, I got to get home and, and prepare this message so I could share the gospel. And immediately, this man came up, comes up to me and says, hello. I said, hi. He says, today is my birthday. I said, well, happy birthday. He says, can you hold my bag? I said, sure, I'll hold your bag. And he says, can you walk with me to the bus stop? And I said, all right. I walk him to the bus stop, and the whole time, I'm thinking, how can I get home quickly so I can prepare this gospel message? <laughs> and so I asked him, so what's in the back? He said, well, for my birthday, I got some beer. So here I am walking down Colfax <laughs> with A.W. Tozer in one hand and a six-pack of Coors Light in the other. And all I could think about is how I could get home and prepare a gospel message. Hello, McFly. I said, okay, let's do it. All right, so I began to talk to him, begin to share my faith with this man. This is Glenn. Glenn is a veteran. Uh, he served in the Vietnam War, and uh, uh, he said he was on his way to the VA hospital to see a psychologist. And so as we get to the, get to the bench, it was covered in ice, so he said, can you walk with me one more, one more block? I said, all right. So we walked down Col Colfax, one more block, and I, and I began to share him more. And I said, oh, I got to preach this Sunday. He said, so I'm preaching on Romans 1, 16. And I share with them, you know, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, then to the Greek. And he, and he began to get a little quiet. And I asked him, I said, is there anything I could pray for you? He said, we could stop right here. Is there anything I can pray for you about? And Glenn says, you can pray that I don't die. He said, can I pray with you right now? He said, no. You can pray that I don't get condemned for drinking. I said, drink, you won't condemn you, Glenn. But not having peace with God will. And he opened his beer and began to drink, and he didn't want to hear anything else after that. The reason why I share this story is because we don't need a pulpit to preach the gospel. The gospel's all around us. We have to have a readiness like Paul, a willingness. And Paul says, I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome. And so Paul would say, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. In the 500th year anniversary of the Reformation, perhaps we too can have this unashamed disposition as Paul. In my opinion, it was vital for the Christians in Rome to hear this. Rome was the capital of the civilized world. It was the center of human power. Rome was the locus center of the Caesar's empire. Remember that it was Roman soldiers who were experts in various torturing methods. 
It was Roman soldiers that nailed Jesus to the cross on Calvary's hill. It was Roman soldiers that had the audacity to gamble for the Lord's clothes at the foot of the cross. Christians in Rome, in Rome was at best a joke that glorified a crucified king, and worse, at worst, it was a threat to the polytheistic gods of the Roman Empire and even Caesar himself. It was seen as an epidemic that must be destroyed. Later on in history, we know that even the Emperor Nero would set Christians on fire for his dinner parties. It was this Rome that Paul would say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. In fact, I'm eager to preach the gospel there. Why is this? Why would Paul say such a thing with this boldness? Perhaps he was aware of Isaiah 40, 15. Surely the nations are but a drop in the bucket. They are nothing more than dust on the scale. And perhaps he was aware of the words of Jesus. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. These may be true, but I would like to submit to you, church, that it was probably Paul's mastery of his understanding of the gospel truth. This is why he wasn't ashamed. He understood the gospel. If you were to ask people what the gospel is, they might say to you, it's the good news. Some of my children may even be able to tell you, it's the euangelion. But why is it the good news? Why? Why is it good news? Why would people sing, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in within, within me? Why would, what would cause Stephen to pray for his executioners while being stoned to death? What would cause William Tyndale to pray that God would open the eyes of the king while being strangled and then burned at the stake? Perhaps some here right now are privately asking the question, do I truly understand this gospel? Do I truly understand this gospel? I know what the words, I know, I know what I've been taught. I could give you the Sunday school answer, but do I really know what this gospel is? Do I really know why it's good news? What's so good about it? So as we look and explore what Paul is mentioning where he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Perhaps it would serve us well to at least list some things of what the gospel is not. The gospel is not the good news so that man can have a more satisfying life here on earth. It is not man's ability to work his way into God's favor. The gospel is not heaven on earth filled with prosperity preaching and naming and claiming entertainment. The gospel is not man bartering with almighty God to secure his heavenly estate after he dies. And it is definitely not a genre of Christian music. This past summer, there were a couple of Mormon missionaries that showed up at my door. They, they come to my door and, and uh, uh, guys, uh, I'm so thankful for my wife, Mrs. McMillan. She's patient with me uh, as we talk and go into the garage. And I asked them a question, a simple question. What's the gospel? You know what they told me? They held out their five fingers and they said, faith, repentance, baptism, bestow the Holy Ghost, endure to the end, praise God. That's what they said to me. If none of these are the gospel, then what is the true gospel that Paul is not ashamed of? I like Dr. Alan Cairn's description. The gospel is a divine revelation as to how God delivers sinners from the state of condemnation into a state of acceptance with God. The gospel is the message of how the wickedness of men are purified of their sins and brought into right relationship with God. 1 Corinthians 1, 23 says, But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, and to Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Ultimately, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. 
Now, when they, let's make no mistake, Paul is not referencing everyone who believes for a, a, a platform for universalism. Paul is referring to all types of people, non-discriminate. The, the gospel for everyone who believes is for both Jew and Greek. Remember who he was obligated to in verse 14. But there is an order to this revelation. He says to the Jew first and then to the Greek. The gospel isn't any more adapted to Jews than to others, but to them have been committed the oracles of God. The Messiah had come through them. They had the law, the temple, and the service of God. Therefore, it was natural that the gospel should be proclaimed to them before it went to the Gentiles. This was the order in which the gospel was actually preached to the world, first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. This was God's divine sovereign plan. In Matthew 15, Jesus is speaking to the Syrophoenician woman and says, A Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed, but he did not answer her. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It was a, it's, it's more of a description on the order by which God has established the gospel, the news of salvation to be propagated from the Jews, then to the Giles, first to the Jews, then to the Greeks. So Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Nevertheless, the emphasis of this verse is on the power of God into salvation. Paul would spend the remainder of this letter proving the point that within the gospel, the revelation of God is imputed righteousness through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And it is efficient for justification, sanctification, and glorification. And I can prove it. In Romans chapter 8, Paul says in verse 28, And we know that all that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Another way of putting it is the gospel, the gospel, the power of the gospel provides the means for us to be saved the continual work of being saved until the final consummation of all things when we shall be saved. When you even look at your own life story, isn't it true that it was the message of Jesus Christ as the only means of salvation and the working of the Holy Spirit that convicted you of sin and he brought you out of darkness and into his marvelous light? Isn't it true that your current beholding of Jesus Christ has moved you out of sins you no longer commit and is causing you to walk in newness of life. Isn't it true that the more you focus on the Savior, the more you desire to be like him, walk like him, speak like him? Isn't it true that the more we mature in Christ-likeness, that it produces a longing for heaven and to leave the things of this world behind so that we can be with them face to face. The gospel is the power of God to give life to the spiritually dead men, grant them adoption as sons and daughters of God, then make them joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That's the power of the gospel. No wonder Paul would say, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. It is this effective working of the power of the gospel that Paul is not ashamed of. Yet even with this, people will still reject the gospel for random reasons. One reason is that they love their sin. Another reason is they want to be their own God. Another reason is they strive to earn God's favor through works righteousness. 
I like it how Kim puts it. If people really understand what we really have in the riches through Christ Jesus, they do anything in the world to get it except nothing. This is what separates self-righteousness from God's righteousness. It's what separates cults from Christianity, religion from relationship, philosophical reasoning from reconciliation with God. This is the power of the gospel. In verse 17, Paul would say, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Paul would state that in, that in it the righteousness of God is revealed, that is the effective power of the gospel, and this is enough. This is what tripped Martin Luther up. Everything inside him wanted to contribute to his own standing before God. In fact, scholars say that he hated this verse because it went against his entire paradigm and challenged the whole system of works righteousness. And we are prone to it, aren't we? This is what our society tells us. You work to get better. You do better. You keep working harder. You keep adding or trying to contribute to the process of grace. And this is what tripped Martin Luther up. In spite of our efforts, Paul would write Romans 3, 10 through 20. Listen to this. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues, they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, when we know that whatever the law says... It speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may be accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So in chapter 1, Paul will say Gentiles who are without the law are condemned, and then he would say, even those who Jewish who are with the law are condemned. What will we say to this? When Adam fell, the whole human race fell with him. And if God, in his holy perfection, wanted to annihilate every person from the face of the planet, he would be just to do so. The author of Hebrews puts it really so hard for us. And again, it's not my intention to be heavy handed, I'm just preaching this truth. Hebrew, the author of Hebrews says, it's appointed for a man once to die, then comes the judgment. What shall we do then? You may ask the question, what about this God of love? What do we do? You may ask the question, what about the God of love? And I'll tell you, Jesus told his, he told his disciples, no greater love hath any man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. Paul would later go on to write in Romans chapter, chapter 5 that God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. Ephesians 2, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, even when we, which we, he loved us, when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ, by grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with, with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that none of us can boast. Jesus told Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. And Paul told Timothy, he says to him, 
There's only one mediator between God and man. It is the man, Christ Jesus. This righteousness has been revealed or uncovered, uncloaked from the Old Testament fathers and the prophets who look forward to the promise and as we look back to the cross. Jesus Christ, the God-man, who never sinned and would be hoisted up on a cross and become the propitiation for our sins, the absorber of God's wrath. This is the righteousness. When his body was torn apart, so was the veil in the temple torn apart, allowing man to come into the holy of holies. The revelation of God's righteousness is that our sins can only be covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And Paul makes this clear it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And Paul writes, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Because of this, we can live in the reality of the lyrics. When he shall come with trumpet sound, O oh, may in him may I be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. Dressed in his righteousness of dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. The gospel in its essence is Jesus Christ plus nothing. The last question we need to answer is, how is this righteousness appropriated? If I have nothing to add to the equation, how is this in transaction imputed? He tells us, by faith. From faith to faith. Surrender all your efforts to the Lord Jesus and place your faith in him. Scripture makes it clear, for my grace for you, through my grace, you have been saved. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul states that this faith is the same from beginning to end, from faith to faith. In other words, the same faith of Abraham is the same faith that we could claim here today. From faith to faith. Not only justified by faith, but faith is the sustainer. The author of Hebrews says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every incumbent and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the, fate, the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, Paul writes, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the just shall live by faith. This puts us where we started, 500-year anniversary. What will they say about us? What will we do? As the political tides change and things begin to change, as our world and begins to walk deeper and deeper into depravity and it begins to look like the last half of Romans chapter 1, what will they say about us? Well, they say the church has been silent. What will they say about you? I hope they write about us. They told the truth. And they held the ground. Will we be ashamed and keep the gospel to ourselves or will we cultivate an eagerness to share the only gospel that saves. And lastly, I, I, don't believe, I don't believe in magic prayers, but I agree with Paul Washer that if during the preaching of the word, God has done a work in your heart, 
that exposes your sin and has convicted you of your sin and caused you to hate it and has changed your relationship with it. I hate this sin and now I want to and desire to serve the true and living God. If that's you, I'm going to ask you at the end of service to come up to the front and one of the elders will speak with you. And come talk to me and I'll come tell you how God got a hold of a dead fool and caused him to walk in newness of life. Let's pray. Father, our Lord, though this word was challenging, we give you the glory, we give you the praise. For you have given us Jesus Christ. He's enough. This we pray for his sake. Amen.